Uh, what's up? It's Deron Jones calling for Tom. Hey, Deron. It's Tom. How are you? Everything good. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. I appreciate your time. Thanks for, you know, doing the interview. All good. It's all good. Cool, man. You know, first off, just want to congratulate you on the release of your new album, Uncensored. You know, how you feeling with the release of this album? Um, it's, it's good, man. I'm, I'm loving it. You know what I'm saying? I it's just a, it's not just an album to me. It represents, you know, a time in my life and, you know, just a time. It represents growth as a man, too. It just represents me standing up on my own and saying everything you want to say and being all that I am as a man and as an artist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, for those of uh, your fans who haven't had a chance to hear it yet, how would you compare the sound on this album to what they're used to hearing from you on the 112 albums? I think in a sense, you know, it's, it's an evolution of that to a certain extent because, you know, like my contribution on the 112 from the writing and production standpoint, you know, was, was pretty big. Like I did like 80% of, of the music the whole time that we mm-hmm. was up a group. So, I mean, with that being said, it was a lot of hip hop influenced music. It was a lot of pop, you know, saying soul, jazz, and gospel. And I think, you know, on this album, you don't get kind of like the same thing. But I think it's more so my way. You know, instead of you know having everybody's input, I'm just doing it my way. But I mean, it's pretty much like a lot of the same things sonically, Mm -hmm. and a lot of the same messages. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, Ashley, about the first single you released, Money, you know. Did you receive any backlash from fans who maybe weren't quite expecting that type of sound from you? You know, what what was the reaction like on that? Yeah, I mean, I did. You know, um, the song Money, it went on a blog um, called Sound Savvy. And uh, the first time it was like, wow, you know, they didn't didn't really understand the sound and they didn't really understand the evolution of my sound. (laughs) So... Um, yeah, I did initially, but for the most part, everybody was just happy to have me back, and they, they understood the song, and they understood, you know, where I was going, and at the end of the day, the bottom line was just a message of courage and faith, and, you know, in a time when we all were kind of dealing with obsession, you know, just to kind of put it out there, like, this is where the future at. Mm-hmm. Like, we often to get back to the money, and we often to be doing it big, and that's really, you know, what the song was, it's just really to inspire. So, <laughs> for the most part, you know, those that were open-minded, you know, was able to receive their message. Yeah. Okay. I understand that. Um, what made you decide to title the album Uncensored? Oh, Uncensored. Well, it, it had a lot to do with just me as, a, as, a, as an artist and as a man, you know what I'm saying? Because as an artist, you know, growing up in the business and coming in the business at 17, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like you become censored because everything that you do has to run through an executive or group of people that have to make the final decision on what it is that you're saying or how you present your product, you know, even how you present yourself. So, I mean, the uncensored title was just a way of me saying, you know, that part of my life is over with. Mm-hmm. The part of my life that anybody can tell me what to say or what to do with my music or with my life in general, like, that's done. Yeah. And now, now completely uncensored. So, do you think what I'm saying, you know, you can get directly from the horse's mouth and, and, and it is what it is now, like, the past is the past, and we're moving forward with the run, and the deep moving. Yeah, okay. You know, so, um, you released the album a little over a week ago on December 5th. Um, you know, how happy have you been with the response you've got on it from fans and, you know, from whoever's heard it? Wow, I mean, the response has really been incredible, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, mostly what I'm getting is that, okay, wow, you yeah. know, I'm happy to see that you're doing an album. A lot of people have to see that I'm doing a solo album because most of the response I'm getting is that I was a lot of people's favorite in the, in the group or whatever, and, and they just have to have to see that okay, you know, you got an album, it's a solo album, and I can I can actually go get it right now. Like most of the response have been like overwhelmed mm-hmm. on the positive side. Yep. <laughs> okay. And um, you know, since you released the album online through your own, you know, your site and on DPS Productions. Do you feel you've had, you know, any difficulty reaching your fan base? Um, no, it's, it's funny you say that, like, it's been very easy to, to reach the fan base. It's like, because of Twitter and because of uh, Facebook. You know, like, I've been using Facebook, really, 
as a marketing tool and using Twitter a lot as a marketing tool and and it's, it makes it a lot easier to reach out to fans and that's that's the thing about being independent right now you know especially being an artist that, that has a fan base already it's like it's like a whole nother world mm-hmm. because you know I came into the game when I mean on my first album the amount of money that I was making per CD was just like you know I, it, it ain't even enough to kind of even mention yeah. but now you know, I get I get every penny from the money that comes in with other CD so we go directly to me and it's, it's just a totally different world now. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I follow you on Twitter. You know, I see you actively on there interacting with fans and all that type of thing. So how has that kind of changed the way you do things? You know, you can get instant feedback from fans, that type of thing. How's it changed the way you interact? Man, it's awesome because, and it's funny that, that you said that because me and my, my team, we sit, we sit around and talk about this a lot. Like, it kind of opens up the playing field. Like, I was kind of talking about this the other day. Like, okay, just say for instance, like what's really has been setting artists apart like say for instance okay I'm Deron and I can sing and I can play the piano and I can produce songs so at the end of the day if if I'm on BET spending you know 30,000 times a week or if I'm on VH1 I mean it just automatically makes me a star for the most part as long as I can pretty much provide that which you know the BET uh, audience is looking for Mm -hmm. but see now that got stuff like YouTube, it's kind of like the playing field has evened up. So who's ever controlling BET and VH1? No, so they really don't control who our stars are anymore. Mm-hmm. Like people can get on and be a star there on their own. And they, you know, a lot of times these outlets that people are used to going to get their music from, you know, they kind of render them powerless in a sense because they're not the only places where you can go and get 22 million people to watch you. Yeah. Or thirty thousand, or forty, or whatever the number is, it's like it, it was a day when the only place where you could get that type of exposure was on a television network. Yeah, and you can get it online. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it kind of opens up the playing field. Like you know, Susie from down the block could be the next Taylor Swift. <laughs> so now, now it's kind of like okay, well now Taylor, what makes you so special? Now it's kind of like everybody got to go that extra mile and interact with the fans and do. It's gonna, I think, it separates. Who's who now? Yeah. It's going to tell who's real about it and who's just doing it just to be doing something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't mean to take anything away from what you're doing because I think you're doing an amazing thing, releasing the album online independently by yourself, that type of thing. But do you feel that maybe there's some some of your fan base that's not on Twitter, you know, not on Facebook, that maybe they don't even really know you have an album out? You know, how, how do you feel about that? Oh, yeah, that, that happens, too. You know, we get a lot of that. So I don't just do everything online. Like, I still kind of get out in the streets as well and try to balance it out. Okay. But it's just uh, the best the best tool that I have at this point is not necessarily just Twitter or, or Facebook, but rather it's just the old school aspect of word of mouth. Yeah. You know, people telling other people and then getting to me that way. Definitely. That makes sense. Um, you know, what's the transition been like, you know, from a group to being a solo artist? Has it been smooth? Well, it, it was kind of difficult for me, actually, because, you know, outside of being in 112, it was just kind of like I was always making songs for somebody else. Mm-hmm. So whenever I'm writing a song, it's like I always had to keep other people in mind, and, and I had to kind of censor what I was saying. I had to write it based on you know, who's going to be saying it. <clears throat> so, just being a producer, period, whether it's producing for 112, Pink, or so, whoever it was that I've been writing and producing for, <clears throat> I kind of had to come to terms with the fact that these are, this is my music. Because it, it took me a while to kind of just swallow it, like, okay, like I'm writing for me now, so it's like, okay, what do I say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that, that, was, that, took, that took a minute for me to kind of just say, I can say what I want to say and I just put my name on it now instead of somebody else's. It kind of took me a minute to, to grasp that concept because I was so used to writing for everybody else. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about your production because uh, you know I'm the type of R&B fan. I, I take the time to read the liner notes. You know I've seen your name. I know you're a very talented producer. And uh, I actually talked to Stevie J, who's another talented producer recently. And he talked about how he had a hand in helping you, you know, learn your craft and production on a on a trip you guys took to Trinidad. 
you know, tell me if you remember anything about that and uh, what you what you remember learning from Stevie J. Man, I'll say to this day, like Stevie J is basically one of the most talented producers I ever ran across. Like I don't, I don't, I don't think I ever met a producer that was more talented than Stevie J because it's like Stevie could play every instrument. So, like when I met Stevie, I just wanted to. He made me want to step my game up, you know. And then that I actually picked up a good guitar when I met Stevie, and then the first the first song that I played the guitar on, on was uh the one that I produced with Keisha. I should have cheated. But that was because of Stevie influence and just being around him. I can't even really say it was just one situation, just being around him, period, like within the bad boy movement, whether it was at daddy's house. And, you know, one thing I learned from Stevie too was that confidence. Like, Stevie always had that confidence. Like, Stevie would say stuff like, <laughs> in the beginning, when we was doing the bad boy thing, he would be like, yo, watch how I change music. Mm-hmm. <laughs> watch how I change, watch how I change what? Watch what I do, you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. I, and I saw that, and I remember that, and as I grew older, it's like, I picked up some of that. You know, you gotta be confident, and you gotta know what's gonna go down, because you're gonna receive a lot of, you know, you don't hear a lot of people saying that, you know, you don't know what you're doing, or, or what's that, or why it don't sound like it used to sound. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it kind of being around him prepared me for that. Yeah. Lot, I mean, I don't know what to say about Steve as far as my I mean, I could, I could go on and on and on, but the main thing is that I, I ain't never met a producer dope in Steve J. Yeah, <laughs> very cool. Um, this might be a difficult question for you to answer, but I figured I'd ask it anyway because you know I went through your whole discography, saw all the songs you've had a hand in writing and producing. You know, do you have uh, a song that you might consider your best, the best song you wrote or produced on? <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, I think. <laughs> You can throw a couple at me if you want, man. I mean, just any, <laughs> anything that comes to mind. Well, um, um, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm a player, you know, on the one to a part three album. Was, mm-hmm. uh, okay. Was one of my favorites. Yeah. You know, and, and I think, uh, the Keisha Call I Should Cheat was one of my favorites because that was a time in, in, in my life when everybody was questioning my abilities. You know, mm-hmm. I feel like people were questioning me as a producer. They were saying, well, what about, what have you done outside of 112? And like, a lot of the songs I was doing at that time, you know, they weren't, they weren't singles on other people's albums. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the, the song with Keisha represents, like, me kind of standing up for myself and what, what I felt my worth was, because that song initially was from Nivea. Oh, wow. And Nivea didn't want to make it a single, and at the time, you know, my manager, he was tripping, you know, he just get the check, you know, just, uh, you know, they gonna cut the check, you know, it doesn't matter if it becomes a single, you know, Lil John got the first single on the album, and this is gonna be a big album for Nivy. Mm-hmm. And I just got to that point, I'm, I was like, yo, I'm tired of my songs, you know, songs that I feel like are big singles, not getting the attention that they deserve, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I was like, if it was another song, man, I'll take the check, but I was like, no, this time I, I'm not checked. I was mm-hmm. like, if they not gonna get this on, man, it's gonna sit in my computer, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna sit in the archives, man, until somebody comes along and realizes that the statement that this song is making for women. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? And then, you know, me and him kind of fell out about that, but, you know, I, I just took a stand, and that song represented a turning point for me as a, as a producer. Like, hey, man, I'm about to make my song single, man. I'm gonna kind of sit my song on people out of where they can't get the exposure that they deserve. And then when that song came out, it was crazy. Yeah. Because it blew, it was the third single, I think it was the third or fourth single for Keisha. And uh, Ron Fair at Inscope had already told me, you know, we're going to put the house on this song, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, they released a couple of singles before. So when that song came out, it was just kind of like everybody who was doubting me because I hadn't had you know, in a while, you know, like, I mean, everybody that I was working with, anybody you could think of, was mm-hmm. like, no, nah, we don't really want to use this stuff right now, you know, so Keisha, like, put me back on Mm-hmm. Wow, that's very cool. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, this this might be you made me think of another you know thing I'd like to ask you. Is there a song now that this might be tough, but that you you wrote for another artist and maybe felt should be a single? Maybe you felt like it would have been a big hit if they released it as a single, but unfortunately that didn't happen. Like, can you remember a circumstance like that? Well, um, well, back in the day. 
I wrote a couple of songs special that mm-hmm. ended up being not on his album, but ended up actually being big one twelve singles. Yeah. Anywhere was for Usher. Oh wow. Okay. Anywhere was for Usher, and that that's when that's when it was for Usher. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. That's cool. You know, how does, how does that make you feel though? Does it, does it almost make you feel like you have vindication that, you know, someone, another artist turned it down and then you were able to turn it into a hit? Yeah, because it kind of made me, it kind of built my confidence because, you know, I'm, I'm a big student. I'm a student of the game. Like, I'm sure, you know, with, with the conversation that we just had about Stevie, you can kind of gather that. Yeah. You know, I, I like to learn. So, as a producer, I was learning to kind of take balance having my emotional ties into the music as well as kind of giving the consumer what they wanted mm-hmm. and giving radio what they wanted like I was kind of fighting this whole little situation at that time while I was growing as a producer so I was listening to things that Puff would say like Puff would say we want to put out balance on our first album and Puff would come to me and say stuff like hey man I just met with five poker in the red they don't want to hear that <laughs> you know what I'm saying so at the end of the day I was learning to find balance with, with my production because I was listening to cats that was on the marketing side where you know other artists they just go in the studio writing whatever they feel but with mm-hmm. me I was kind of like listening to what the cats on the marketing side on the executive side was saying and I was kind of checking that in so you know mm-hmm. yeah, okay. was, I was getting to that point where you know I was I was involved in that that, that thought process when I would write songs yeah okay um, you know, besides your album that you have out now, are you currently in the studio writing and producing with other artists, or do you have plans to for the future? Right now, I'm working with my sister. Her name is Sunny Jones, and uh, she's gonna be out. We're gonna drop the EP on her in the spring or whatever. So, you know, right now, um, we put out a snippet of her song, uh, "Play My Position," and a lot of people are digging that. So, we all um, we're gonna drop that in, at the top of the year, mm-hmm. like a five-song EP to introduction to get people know who she is and how she get down. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, you know, I, I had a chance to interview Mike, you know, from the group as well recently. And, uh, you know, he was okay. saying uh, he still hopes the group 112 can get back together someday and make it work. You know, is that your hope as well one day? That's fair. Um, you know, looking back at 112, what would you say is the legacy of the group? I mean, you guys achieved so much, you know. What do you think is a lasting legacy? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, one of the, one of the great things about 112 is that together and how long we actually, you know, stayed together. Like a lot of groups that were before us, I think they didn't stay together as long as 112 did. And, mm-hmm. uh, of course, you know, hit records and just the way that we touch people, man, in a positive way with the music. As a brand, I mean, nobody can ever take that away. Mm-hmm. That's true. Um, that's all I had prepared, man. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Oh, um, man, I just want to say thank you for your time and, you know, taking the time out. And I want to say thank you to everybody that, you know, supports um, me as an artist. Um, and... Oh, no, man, I just be looking forward to some new music because I'm going to just keep giving it out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cool, man. Let me just say, Duran, as a fan of you and as a fan of 112, you know, it's been a pleasure, and I'm just glad you're still making music, still making good music, and I uh, hope you just keep doing what you do because, you know, your fans love to hear it. All right. Thanks, I appreciate it. Thanks so much, man. Best of luck to you in the future. All right. Take care. Take care.